Okay, welcome to another C Stand Up Presents episode, man. Right now, I have one of the most influential dudes in Chicago. I I think you're kind of underrated, bro. I, I I don't know that you know what your star is like, and that's what we're gonna um, go into right now, because you're all you're kind of like a mysterious dude in the Chicago <laughs> scene, right? Uh, Ron Baker Jr., you know what I mean? Give it up for that brother, man. If you're sitting in your house watching this, you're about to learn something about comedy slash Chicago comedy. First of all, Ron, man, I want to say thank you for inspiring me. Back in the day, I used to have the opportunity or the, uh, the privilege to be behind the uh, board on at All Jokes Aside watching you do what you do. Um, I'm not sure even what phase of your um career you were in at that time because like i said man you you are this uh anomaly that brothers kind of in chicago uh you know may have not studied as much as they can which i think uh, it should be but that's what it is i tell you what man black don't crack because i know you about 82 years old <laughs> <laughs> I just, i'm in my 50s i'm in my 50s <laughs> okay i'm about to hit another one uh you yeah. know 50 50 i think 54 in april next oh, month. okay okay no problem we, we kind of around the same age but what i do remember man is you know all jokes aside was early 90s bro right, right. we look back and uh, I was I doing comedy you, way before then, though. Yeah, I know. I know you had already established yourself. So do me a favor, man. Tell people how you started and when you started. Well, I started in the early 80s, uh, mm -hmm. 1983, really. Okay. I was I was in junior high school. Yeah. Uh, doing comedy. I was in high school doing comedy. I was doing talent shows, forced by my dad to get up <laughs> on stage. Yeah. Uh, and perform for his banquets. Mm. Uh, I always said my daddy is like the Joe Jackson of comedy. Okay. Was he beating y'all? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, back <laughs> no, then, he, was, he was really, the really, once he realized there was talent there, yeah. he was really adamant because my dad actually did comedy as well. Really? Before he was a preacher, he was, he did impressions. He was kind of like Reggie Reg. Okay. So he was All a right. comedy, a, a comedian impressionist. Okay. And awesome. He was a comedian impressionist. So he rec I never saw him perform because what was his name? Uh, he was uh, Ronald Baker. Oh, okay, so Ron Baker Jr. All right. there you no, go. he was Ronald Baker. Yeah, he was Ronald Baker. Yeah, and um, that's how everybody knew him was Ronald Baker. When he started preaching, he was Reverend Baker. Okay. And uh, so when I started doing comedy, I wanted to distinguish myself a little bit different. Yeah. From the Ronald Baker. Plus, I hated Ronald McDonald all the time. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm sure. White people would still say, "Hey, Ronald McDonald." I hated Ronald McDonald. For the people who don't know, Ronald McDonald was the spokesperson for McDonald's. McDonald's yeah. Some people may not know that because they got rid of Ronald McDonald. Oh, wow. You know what? I didn't even notice that they got rid of Ronald McDonald. Yeah, they, got, wow. they got rid of him many, many years ago. There's still the Ronald McDonald house. Yeah. You can see Ronald McDonald sitting yeah. on that bench in front of the house. Right. But he's a, he's a clown. Ronald McDonald's a fucking clown. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, John Wayne Gacy messed up clowns for everybody. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Wow, that took a strange turn. We went from Ronald McDonald to John Wayne Gacy. No, no. I mean, you brought up <laughs> clowns. I'm like, why would they get rid of him when he was one of the biggest icons? But we're talking about you, bro. Right, right. We don't want to. So, yeah, we're not interested in, in McDonald's. Your father was uh, an influence on you because he had influence. talent. He had, he had a biggest influence, which we know that's the case most of the time. Not most of the time. When people have a father in the home, it's extremely in, uh, influential. And I think that's part of why they kind of, you know, politically move that in that direction. But you start. That's another topic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, we, we touch it so much. That's why right. I said we need to go. We'll touch on that later, how they move the daddies out. Exactly. You know, they James Evans are daddies. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. But you had one, and he was a preacher, so obviously his moral compass was solid, uh, which is a reflection on you and your brother, and we're, we're not going to talk about him right now. This is about you, right? So you started as a teenager. We were, we were a team, though. Me and my brother were a team. It was both of us. Oh, I didn't even know he ever did. But that's comedy, how it started. Man. It was him and I together. It was not just me. Okay. It was him and I together. We worked out an act. Isn't that uh, something? Church, church routine. We were imitating people yeah. in the church and imitating celebrities. Yeah. And we had mapped up a, a Smothers Brothers type of routine. We wore blue blazers, uh -huh. white shirts, gray slacks. Right. And right. that's how uh, that was our look. 
white shirts, gray slacks. <laughs> right, with, 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 the, uh, with the tie, we had the, okay. uh, uh, I think we had on a red striped tie, a blue striped tie, something like that. Yeah, yeah. We look real corny. But we look very presentable, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because our parents dressed us up all the time, so right. the whole Easter suit thing is still in us, if you could tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've no, I've always noticed, man, that you are a sharp uh, dresser, and it's a, it's a lineage to that to that uh, church world. Yeah, you know. Right, and not only that, but my dad also groomed us to look presentable on stage, which was a reflection of like a Flip Wilson. Yeah. Okay. Bill Cosby. If you know, Flip Wilson was very, very sharp. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, Flip, Flip Wilson doesn't get enough credit for who he was as a oh. comedian in that era with his yeah. own television show. They right. took the television show from Richard Pryor, but Flip Wilson's lasted a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I actually paid attention to the comics of old that were all dressed mm -hmm. uh, all the time. So it was always about looking very sharp when you were on stage for me. And not to mention my dad always looked sharp as well. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, man. But you also were extremely good, man. Uh, incredibly funny, uh, personable, absolutely dressed to the tees or, you know, what it is. Mm -hmm. And you, for, from my remembrance of seeing you behind there, because, you know, I was the DJ at that time, so I, I watched I everybody. I watched everybody. <laughs> right. Um, you, could t you could handle all crowds. There wasn't a crowd that I saw you not really be, like, able to uh, tank, bro. So... Because to that. prior to that, prior to getting to, to uh, All Jokes Aside, which was the first black comedy club in Chicago, yeah, I was working with Pat McGill or D, uh, uh, what's that dude? Uh, I was working with Andre and Dose. Dose, I was finna uh, Andre and Dose. Name. Yeah, Andre and Dose. Good old Dose. What happened to Dose, you know? I read, you know, when I was working at GCI driving the truck, I ran into him on the northwest side. Uh -huh. uh, back in that, I think he still had a tank top on with, you know, muscle bound. <laughs> right. For those who remember those. But a, a lot of what I was doing uh -huh. before it even got to Jokes and Notes, I lived in New York. Oh, yeah. I remember hearing about that. I right. I lived in New York and I left early mm. before comedy was even being done here. Mm. I left in the eighties, right out of high school. I went out of high school. I went to the military and out of the military, I met a friend in the military who said, come to live in New York. This yeah. comedy thing is about to bust open real big. So I just left. My dad bought me a one way ticket to New York. Yeah. And his name was Herman and I stayed with him in Harlem. Okay. Was um, Herman a comedian or he was just he a was good not boy? a comedian, but he was into comedy <clears throat> okay. and he was into writing, but yeah. I was performing in the military. Oh, because wow. again, going back now to the to the early '80s, yeah, I was man. already performing in talent shows with my brother. Yeah, I was doing. Uh, me, my brother and I were doing uh, church banquets. Yeah. So the pastors would say, "I like these guys. Can they come do my banquet?" So right, if you know absolutely. About the church world, right. they have pastors banquets, anniversaries, and right. things of that nature. So we became popular doing that and entering talent shows. Gavin School in Chicago Heights, yeah, winning five hundred dollars first place. Nice. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot of money back then. If you have any wine candies you can buy for two hundred and fifty dollars, exactly. I was that nigga when I won that money. I know. And go to Mr. Johnson's candy store. I was yeah. like, "Give me fifty Bob Daddies, nigga. <laughs> Twenty People, wine candies. Right. Give People me one hundred lemon cookies. And I told Ooh, them, them lemon cookies. The lemon boy. cookies. Loose. Man. Loose lemon cookies. <laughs> and, right. and Mr. Johnson would count with his hands. Yeah, absolutely. He count the cookies. He get the cookies with his bare hands. And count your money with your bare hands. And you didn't give a shit. No, you ate man. the loose lemon cookies. <laughs> hey. I had the brown bag of wine candies. Right. And uh, everybody, all the girls on the playground was my bitch that day. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Not to not to even mention that you was going into somebody's house a lot of the time. Right. <laughs> but, right. These days, they it can't was even his do house. that. Yeah, exactly. It was literally his house. Right. And he built a little window. You would stand outside. Yep. Yep. And Mr. We, Johnson, you know, with that shaky hand, he, he was old. <laughs> right. Trying to make his social security. Right. And fish. I don't know if you remember the sweetest fish were loose hey, before they went in the bag. All of that. The little penny chews, the green penny ones, Listen, the real. Give me 99 of them, nigga. Yep. I just won $250. <laughs> exactly. Telling jokes. I'm a kid. Yeah. Telling jokes. Yep. 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 And, Absolutely. And again, man. I'm watching the greats. That's how yep. I. I'm learning. And my dad would have me stand in front of a mirror. 
okay. in the living room. Yeah. And he taught me, the first thing he taught me was how to work the room. Yeah. Look to the left, look to the right. Right. Look to the middle. Yeah. This is before he's preaching now. Mm -hmm. He gets called to preach later, but he's telling me how to center myself. Yeah. And if I'm nervous, how to look at the back of the room. Right, right. But how to speak to the, to how to uh, speak and enunciate so the person in the back of the room right. can hear me. Now, Absolutely. what happens, how, where that comes from is we did Easter speeches. My brother and I will always tell you we did Easter speeches and we got Easter speeches when they were paragraphs long. Right. And did you, you have to, to remember? Memorize did you have to, oh, you had to memorize them. Right. Yeah. So you got them in January. Yeah. They were handed out in January and we had Easter speech rehearsals mm -hmm. because Easter would hit in April. Yeah. And you had to memorize the paragraphs and you had to move, you had to do like choreography. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, they hung him high, they stretched him wide, he hung his head, and for me, he died. And then he rode, you know. Yeah. It was wow. you still and then my mother would be him. right there in the front, <laughs> yeah. you know, when it was time to do the speech, she'd be like, You better not embarrass me. Uh, <laughs> it would be like, she get home from work, get your Easter speech, let me hear it. Yeah. You had to know it. Yeah, yeah. So as a awesome. comedian, you have yeah. to know your material. Absolutely. At a moment at the New York taught me that they said if you awaken at awakened up at midnight and say you're on, you need to know your set that you're doing, right. know your material, know right. your start, know your middle, know your end, <laughs> right, and hit it. So when I got to New York, I I go to the improv like the first night I get there. Who's in the room? Jerry Seinfeld. Okay. I had no idea who this was. In this, in eighty. This is early eighties. Okay, so had so he popped right in? Huh? Was he just a regular dude, or had he started getting some bubble? He was. He had popped by then. I, I don't know. I'm. I'm this young guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm in a room, and yeah. he would draw numbers right out of a hat, and if they picked your number, you were on the lineup. You got to get on. Yeah. This is very very early '80s. So who um, else was in the room? Let's Jim Carrey is in the room. Okay. This is all before we know them. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, other future cast members of Saturday Night Live. Who was? I remember every week I would go in this competition, in this uh, in this club, because they were trying to do comedy in, in in all kind of places in New York. Oh, man. So they would do them in cabarets, yeah, in bars, and every week I got beat by this woman <clears throat> named Rosie O'Donnell. You kid, really? <laughs> I think I still have a card. Do you, you know, do I'm, you I'm, I'm meeting people who would later become <laughs> yeah. stars. So now I'm walking down the street again. This might be my second night in New York. Yeah. And I see this uh, sign that says comedy, and it was like uh, in a garden apartment. You know, you walk down the stairs. New York is set up a little bit different, and it would be like a restaurant Yeah, in there. And uh, I watched this cat do comedy, mm -hmm. and he's killing. Yeah. yeah. So there's a second show, and I stay, you know, because I'm hungry. I want to learn, you know. Yeah. He does another show. He does the exact same routine. Right. So the first question I ask him when I get a chance to see him is, you did the exact same show twice. Every time I go up, I do a different show. He said it was a different crowd. Mm -hmm. He said, if you're going to learn how to last in this game, you know, you have a set yeah. that you do. Exactly. And even though it's a different crowd, you do the same set. And he taught me how to hit it, the same inflections. You hit it at the same spots. Yep. And his name was Lance Crowder. If you know who Lance Crowder is from Chicago, that's Pootie Tank. You kidding? I didn't know he was from Chicago, man. He came from the South Side. Yeah, that's he crazy. Took me, he took me under his wing. Yeah. And the Pootie thing said, let me introduce you to somebody. Uh -huh. And he took me to this little uh, uh, little club. And uh, he said, this is my friend Chris Rock. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, wow. And Chris said, let me introduce you to somebody. Uh -huh. And it was Adam Sandler. Right, right. Yeah. So then Adam took me and with me, and he, I'm with uh, Kevin Nealon. You know, okay. Saturday Night Live, you know. Yeah. I'm seeing all these people who are currently on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. And it's and, yeah, you know, awesome, man. That yeah, I, I But they're I, teaching me. They're all teaching me stuff. Yeah. Well, y'all working together as comedians, right? And we kind of innately teach each other. Because really, you know who taught me that every, that comics do the same set was BL. Because, yeah, yeah. yeah, because I wasn't uh I wasn't a comic when I started uh DJing. I was actually a DJ in college. My my team, my guy, my roommate had all the equipment. We used to do the majority of parties. 
Mm-hmm. So my best friend, Patrick Chris, you know, Patrick Chris, uh, Pat, he ended up getting me a job because my my uh, corporate job wasn't paying me that much. I was doing uh, mortgages and, and uh, fund lending wasn't paying me that much. And I was had too much idle time. So I was like, let me get a second job. He gave he got me. I didn't know comedy. You know, what I mean, I thought it was kind of goofy at first. But then when I got to see the pros rotate in. One of the first ones who did his set extremely accurately set up was BL. And I was like, he does the same set every time. You know what I mean? But it was murdering. Right. Because it was polished. Yeah, it was so polished. It was, it was, it, it felt like he was making it up. In fact, after the show, right. people would come up to him like, yeah, you remember, man, I was sitting over there. You, you, I was the dude who you said had teeth like a beaver, man. I, you so funny, blah, blah, blah. And they, they always thought that that was like just him making up that shit on the spot. Yeah. He knew where he was going. It, absolutely. So I, I, I see what you're going with that. But here you are in the middle of this crowd of now multimillionaire famous comedians. You're kicking it with them. Mm-hmm. And had you, what happened to pull you out of that circle? I was starving to death in New York as a young uh, person, as okay. a young, young t- again, I'm a kid. Yeah. And I, this is me trying to learn mm-hmm. how to become a comedian. And Chris gave me a lot of valuable information. Uh, I remember we would sit and talk. I think it was a place called the Green Kitchen or something like that. Mm-hmm. And he was always talking about these movies he had. He was, I was always business. Him and Adam Sandler was always, Adam was in school at uh, New York University at the time. He was like, you know, I, I'm in film school, who I thought would never make it, by the way. Really? Was strange. I thought he would never make it. Um, was he and Jerry Seinfeld on that night, Jerry Seinfeld didn't get the most laughs either. He didn't really even seem to be, be that funny. It was other guys that was killing. But I've discovered too, it's not about killing the room. No, it never is. I've never been a, when, when, when producers are looking for you. Yeah, yeah. I, I've never been a Seinfeld makes me laugh, dude. Mm-hmm. I always thought that he, he was a uh, he was he was part of the white privilege vein of life. Him, I don't I thought oh, Alex Sandler's movies were incredible, but his uh, his comedy was like that alt comedy stuff. And and mm-hmm. I, I came into a, a, a nest in Chicago with a lot of these alt comedy white boys. Um, and so I understood what it was, and I liked what they do, but they were never my favorite comics, you know. It was a different world. So before Jokes and Notes, or All Jokes Aside, should I say, I was in Catch a Rising Star. Okay. I was in um, the Improv. But a lot of these comedy clubs in Chicago are gone. Yeah, yeah. So I know. Um, some of the names escape me right now. Yeah. But these white comics were different. So the Judy Tenutas. Yeah. yeah. Who would get up there with an accordion. Right. And, and be smashing the room. It was just a whole different vibe. Because a lot of black people were not in the comedy clubs to even watch comedians at that time. Uh, I think Catch a Rising Star was inside of the Hyatt on uh, Wacker. OK, the, wow. What a, what a that. great. That was a hot spot. Place. Yeah, what a great location. It was, a, it was fantastic. Uh-huh. And um, oh, I wish I could pull out some of those other names of those comedy clubs. I, I'm doing them all in Chicago. Yeah, learning how to uh, maneuver. Yeah, and learning how to write, and that's thanks to Andre uh, mm-hmm. Lavelle. Yeah, and you know what? Pe- I don't think people. Uh, I think people hear about, it, but they don't understand that even the segregation of Chicago leaks into comedy. It's less now because there's been so many doors open. And the internet makes people interchange. But when I first started, which was around the time that you were already flourishing, mm-hmm. you were, uh, I, like I said, you were one of the influences that I got to see um, flourish. Comedy was very segregated. You very few, uh, like Zanies had like two black folks plus Dwayne Kennedy that they would deal with, you know, every three months, every three to four months. It was hard to get in there, but and you had to be presentable you yeah. had to be uh, palatable. And, right. you know, uh, if you brought too much of that Def Jam comedy, they, they, don't like that. they wasn't messing with you, even though they were foolish because that was making more money than them. If you really look at it. It was the, the cats who did that, which, I, you know, I've never seen Def Jam ever. You never, weren't you on it or something? 
No, I turned it down, I think, when an opportunity came to me. Because okay. at this time, I decided I was going to be doing clean comedian, yeah, yeah. comedy. I was going to be doing clean comedy. I was doing a lot of the churches, and the churches were paying me very well. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, but that was an illusion for me as well. Really? Yeah, that was very much an illusion because in my mind, I thought I would become what Kirk Franklin has become for music. I thought I would become that for comedy. Okay. And Jonathan Slocum was doing it before I was doing it. Yeah, yeah. And he had a comedy album out that was really big in the church community. Right, right. And um, he has a story about that, of how how that worked for him. And then, you know, I, when I went out with Take Six and BB and CC Winans, uh, that really you. helped. Yeah. Uh, they had me at the... The Hollywood Theater, the Hollywood Bowl, mm -hmm. and there's nothing but celebrities out there, and they were all coming back there to see me. Uh, Stevie Wonder was was like, you know, he was like, "Oh my God, you you are so fabulous! Are you going to be in Fresno?" <laughs> um, and I had a joke about Stevie Wonder. Yeah. I was auditioning for *The Living Color* twice. Wow! I was I down to that. the I was down <clears throat> to the final finals mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. I'm beat out by Jamie Foxx and. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, David Allen Greener. Of course, he's not a comedian, but Tommy Davidson. I didn't know impression. who any of these people were. Yeah, nobody did at that time. Hey, just to let you know, man, we're going to end this. This one is going to close at, and we're going to start a second edition to this because this is, unless you got, you well, know. Really, there's a part two? <laughs> yeah, there's going to be a, I'm going to meld them together. But the thing that I'm on, I'm not paying for Zoom. So I only got, uh, you know, I have to, uh, only get an hour. You got the AOL disc that they sent to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm not the paying. The first uh, 20 minutes free. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. It's the first hour is free. And that's cool. I just reboot up, you know. But anyway, you were, uh, so let me hit that little spot right there so I know where it's at. We cut it on the on the tape. Um, so, yes, man, what a fantastic story, man. You're saying that right now you are like one of the hottest cats, which I remember you being like super sizzling, especially in the church and the black folks mm -hmm. that don't love cussing realm, right? Um, so go ahead, continue until this thing needs to be switched up, man. We'll, we'll set it right back up. You say go ahead, right now? Yeah, continue, man. Continue. Yeah, the the uh, again, it seemed it seemed like it was really good at the time. I was also on GCI. Yeah. Uh, Bonnie Deshong. Yeah. Saw me at Loyola <clears throat> performing at a talent show because talent shows were happening, and I was that was another way for me to get cash because mm -hmm. it was so hard again to get it booked at these white comedy clubs. Yeah. Yeah. And. I had these crowds at these colleges that my friends were at because I wasn't in college at the time, but they would get me into these talent shows. But I did it in Loyola, mm -hmm. Paula Sykes and Sonia Sykes got me in this Black Student Union talent show. And Bonnie Deshaun was there and Harold Lee Rush Jr. OK. I owe a lot to them because they went right to Doug and said, I just saw this guy, Ron Baker Jr. The next day they had me on air mm -hmm. at the hottest morning show in Chicago right. with Doug Banks. Yeah, yeah. If you remember anything about Doug Banks in the morning on WGCI when yeah. they were on South Michigan Avenue. Right. Well, where my radio heads at in Chicago, not North Michigan, but on South Michigan right. Avenue. And to me, it was like it was the Oscars or something. You know? Yeah, was, I'm sure you felt like, like, hey, I made it. I made it. I'm on my way. Yeah. Man, you know, I'm so Doug interviews me and the interview goes very well. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'm doing more shows and as time would go by, uh, Elroy Smith would give me my own radio show. Really? I didn't realize that. I well, what time was it on? At two in the morning or something? I don't remember you have that. I remember you being but, in the truck. Like they were saying, Get Your Praise On is my show. Get Your Praise On on Sundays is my, all oh, of that is my wow. invention. All, all of that is my invention El by, that Elroy Smith said. We want to develop this show. That's all my development. Oh, wow. I didn't that's recognize all my that because that's like a Chicago iconic show. That's oh, all, that was that was all done by me. Oh, wow. Delroy Smith and me. And, and then so how did the they steal that, it from you? <laughs> there's a story for that, too. Uh, okay, well, we're going we to we gonna, we gonna wait. Pause right there so we can reset up and do this uh, uh, so we don't have miss none of this. Cause this I feel is like Little Richard. I'm the architect of Chicago comedy, and they never <laughs> right. gave me nothing. 
Shut up. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Bitches. <laughs> All right, How so many he... people have I helped? Exactly. Fred Robinson, Deion Cole. Uh oh. Ain't nobody uh-oh. reaching back. Oh, oh, we're going to go through some of that too, man. So Come on, Little Real Howard used to open for me. Oh, man. That that, that makes sense. Corey Let's... Hoku. Damn. Bernie right. Mac. Okay. All Vanessa right. Fraction. Am I saying it? This is not being recorded, is it? This is. This is still being recorded. And and why shouldn't it be? You know what I mean? So <laughs> why shouldn't it be? Um, Ain't nobody gave me nothing. I, f- I do feel like Little Richard. <laughs> the Rolling Stones used to be my backup band. The Beatles were my backup singers. James Brown used to sleep on my couch. <laughs> you like, you telling me something because I ain't never paid attention to Little Richard. I usually turn it off when he come on. <laughs> Little Richard is the art. Listen, Little Richard is the architect of rock and roll. Of rock and roll for sure. His licks, a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis stole from him. Just about everybody stole. You talking about stealing from James Brown? He yeah. discovered James Brown. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that, and I've yeah, seen Little him Richard say that right. type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, he was the real deal. He helped everybody, and nobody gave me nothing. <laughs> when Bernie Mac calls me from the set, a lot of people don't know this, Bernie Mac calls me from the set of the Bernie Mac show, upset because I wrote him a letter asking him to help me. Really? Could I help him? Yeah, could I help him? Could I work for him in any kind of way? Could I carry his bag? He was so detached at that time yeah. on what was going on yeah. And he and I were close friends. I would eat at his house. Yeah. You know, uh, I used to, you said, Ron, you, uh, you want to stay for dinner? I said, what you have? And he said, food, nigga. <laughs> you <eat> food? <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Relationship with the Ooh. family. You know, it's amazing, though. A lot of Chicago people, you can help them and they'll never come back and get Yeah. Them. Yeah, I know. I, I New know York that. helps each other. And I saw that. Right. You know, I saw Chris put a lot of people on. And again, as, as I left New York, from being, you know, I'm starving. I ended up having to go back home. I should have just actually stayed there, but you know, I didn't want to be Ooh. sucking dick in all these parking lots. Yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree with that conclusion, bro. Uh, everything has its place and its destiny uh, unfolds, and maybe this was your destiny, and it would have been. It's a good retrospective or retroactive thought to go say I should have stayed there. Aaron, I, listen, Aaron, I always wonder had I stayed there, and I believe I should have stayed there. Well, how was you going? Where was you going to stay? How much? How was you going to eat? This is what I've come to realize, Aaron, and 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 I would like everybody to hear this. At some point in time, yeah, you're going to reach uh, an abyss type situation where you don't know, yeah, and it's going to require your faith. And you're just going to have to fall. You're going to have to jump. You're going to have to leap. You're going to have to walk and just trust. Uh, for me, it'll be trust God that mm-hmm. you are going to make it. If this is what you uh, are passionate about, this is what you believe you were called to do. And my dad said on the phone, when I told him I run out of money, he said, that when you're broke, the best place to be is at home. And that was good from his point of view. But it really was not the best advice because I should have stayed there because when I came back, yes, I was doing stuff here. Mm-hmm. But then things began to click from the, those people that <clears throat> left. You know, next thing you know, I see Chris on David Letterman. As he said he was trying to do, I see him on Saturday Night Live. I see Adam uh, on Saturday Night Live. I see all these other people um, who are very famous now. That was the time for me to stay. Right. Um, the late 80s, early 90s, that was the time. Now, God can redeem the time, mm-hmm. and he can do it in my olden years. Many times I say I'm an Abrahamic type comedian. I feel like God promised me a child mm. uh, after I didn't have one, and now I'm in my late 90s, 100s, and he said, you're going to have one, and I, and it seems like all I keep her- having is miscarriages. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, regardless of how good people think I am, the powers that be have to let you in that door. So that is that's absolutely the uh, the case there, my man. But when God opens the door, no man can close it, and when God closes it, no man can open it. So part of what I am and who I am may be uh, helping other young comedians because I get asked a lot, "Can can you help me?" And I just teach them what I know. You know, I don't feel I'm the greatest comic at all. I just learned how to tell a joke. Um, I was able to good, you know, put you know words together that people find humorous. Mm-hmm. I'm thankful that I've been able to to live and uh, still eat 
from being able to tell the jokes, but I'm still not at the level what I'd like to be at. You know, when, uh, um, who's the comedian now whose name was slips in my mind at the time, the big, big older comedian, dark guy. Why am I forgetting his name? From Chicago? No, he's not from Chicago. He was George Wallace. So George, George Wallace, George Wallace uh, who helped me out back in the day. Uh, and sometimes people can forget you as you all move apart, but uh, he saw me again and he had me come back in open form. And uh, Samuel L. Jackson was there and many other comedy they were coming up to me going, hey, This is in Chicago or this is in LA? This is Chicago, in Chicago. Oh, okay. Damn, uh, Sam Jackson was there, huh? But I was so stunned and I was yeah. just like, you said, I said, you're Sam Jackson. He said, I sure in the hell am. <laughs> I love that dude, man. <laughs> you know, when I was in LA with Take Six, everybody, you know who I hung out with that I was tight with while I was out there? Donnie Osmond and Kirk Cameron. Wow. That's crazy. And you know who was with me, performing with me on that show and wrote jokes for me? Who? David Hollister. Oh, wow. The singer? The singer. And David <laughs> stayed out there and I didn't. Yeah. And next thing you know, um, I think he's on the Tupac soundtrack singing. Uh, I just wanted to name some of these comedy clubs, man. Here it is. Zany's, Improv, Jokes and Notes, All Jokes at Riddles, Catch a Rising Star, yeah. uh, Sweetwater, Stand Up New York, The Funny Bone. That's what I was trying to remember. Yeah, The, the Funny Bone. bone. Yeah. The Funny yep. Bone. Comedy You Grand. Mm -hmm. uh, Stand Up New York. So I did, I did 6,000 people in, in Great America when they were doing the... Uh, the uh, Six Flags Gospel Superfest. Wow. And a lot of comics were intimidated by large audiences, especially outside. And I, I was that. doing a lot of those yeah. with, with the major artists. Right, I right. My set and, and got the, the roar of 6,000 people laughing at one time. Uh, Robert Townsend, when he was doing Partners in Crime at UIC, yeah. he came up to me and live, he, he, he healed my, he said, do you want to go up? I said, yeah. He didn't even say, do you want to go up? He said, you Ron Baker Jr.? Yeah, he said, yeah. He said, go up and give me a hot five. And it was 10,000 people packed up. This is when Damon Wayans, if you remember the poll partners in crime, yeah. uh, all of those comedians that were on that show were live in Chicago and he let me open it and I killed. Of course, of course and you did. And from that, he, he let me audition uh -huh. uh, for this show called, this movie called The Five Heartbeats. To play oh, Peter. wow. So you auditioned for that too, man? Auditioned wow. for that to play. Let me tell you who else. Then I got an audition uh -huh. to be the drummer in this movie called, wait for it. It's one of my favorite movies. Don't cry. No, listen, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mo Better Blues. You kid, man. Um, and so I'm in the audition room and, and it's all these people. So it was... Uh, all these light skinned women that look the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Cinder Williams was in there. You know? Ooh. And she <laughs> said, she said, uh, you this, you, you want to just practice? I said, sure. And so yeah. she reads her lines, I read mine, and then she goes, You're not an actor, are you? Again, I'm not an actor. Yeah. I said, How I'm do you thinking. know? She said, Because you didn't lean in to kiss me. She uh -huh. says, Whenever the script calls in for whatever it calls for, even when you're practicing, you, you, you do it. Yeah. You know, but, uh, I'm so thinking. Which, uh, so what? Which which character would you have been in? Mo I was the drummer in the band. Oh, okay, okay. And they ended up going with Wynton Marcellus's band and his real drummer. Yeah. And his real drummer. And it was only a couple lines, but I yeah. would. He was still throughout the movie. Right. Right. But That's when still... I read the script, I read for Wesley Snipes' part. Wow. That's okay. the part I had read for. Yeah. So again, I'm new. I don't even understand scripts. I don't understand yeah. a lot of stuff. And then. Uh, I auditioned to be for Sinbad's show. Sinbad had me audition for his show. He had a TV show briefly that okay. I auditioned for. Was again, it a, a stand-up stand show? Was it a sitcom? No, it was a sitcom. It was a sitcom, okay. It was a sitcom. And then I auditioned for In Living Color the first season. And yeah. I made it to the, the final pick of everybody they were going to pick. Yeah. And I'm and Keenan loved me. And my joke that got me in was I did Stevie Wonder on Win, Lose, or Draw. Oh, that's hilarious, dude. And I actually had <laughs> I actually had the, the flip over paper and I was scribbling. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they were yelling out what I was doing. They were just, you yeah. know, just and they were yelling out. They were like, a uh, snake, a word, you know. And right. the time went off. And, and again, I got the dark glasses on. Yeah. And they went in. I said, what was it? I said, it was a ribbon in the sky. <laughs> they blew up. It blew Listen, up. Keenan spits whatever his water. He like does a spit take. He's like, yeah. he's like this dude right here. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then exactly. he puts me in a room with all these major cats. Yeah. And uh, Anthony Griffin, if you remember him from uh-huh. here, these are, these are some, I was going up against cats who have been doing comedy way before me. Right, right. He put us in this room, and the final audition was he whispered something different in everybody's ear. And when he said, when I yell action, because you're like at a party, do whatever it is that I whispered in your ear. And yeah. he just wanted to see how we were improv. And then from that, he picked who he wanted. Yeah. And uh, Crystal Takia. Oh, man, she was a beautiful, I mean, yeah, that was, was, is a, a beautiful. Yeah, yeah. She's she from a, Chicago? She got, she's from Chicago. Wow, she I got didn't picked. Know. Okay. And, um, the major cats, one of the major cats got picked and they, they were almost suicidal when they didn't get picked. They were so upset. Yeah. And Anthony decided that he was going to get in his car and just drive to LA. And he did. The next thing I know, I saw him on Bob Hope's Future Comics. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, so he got in that, that vein. He was opening for Bernie Mac as well. Yeah. But the, the white vein was really the way to go. And Living Color hadn't actually come on TV yet. Mm. It was something he was working on. But I've been involved with all of these yeah. things that have should come. Uh, uh, Sharon King saw me performing at one of the banquets and mm-hmm. she gave me some shots to audition, but she said, uh, you need some acting lessons, which I never took. Mm. I so never Joe took. Jackson didn't come beat you for that? He should have got At him. this time, you know, things were moving so fast for me yeah. and I was doing a lot of stuff for free. It got to the point that- um, That's the big problem in our business. Yeah, I was doing it for free and then he came in my room, he said, you are no longer going to work for free. That's when Joe Jackson came in. He says, yeah. there's going to be some form of payment you get. And I couldn't imagine somebody even paying me like $75 for these little jokes that yeah. I that I had come up with. But I told somebody $75 and they were like, oh, no problem. And it was yeah. from that point on. And I think I had that first check. And then- uh, <laughs> You kept the check, I, you didn't I, cash I, it. Uh, I did, I think I just, I think I have the, is it a check or the, the uh, the receipt or something I have. Okay. I have something of this, like my first yeah. uh, payment for telling jokes. And then a Denise Neal Higgins, a lot of what you see of who I am is because of the late, great Denise Neal Higgins, okay. uh, Andre Lavelle, and okay. those. It was those three people. And then it was, um, uh, how, how can, oh, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, oh, I, I hate that I'm forgetting his name. Lonnie. Lonnie. Lonnie, 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 listen, yeah. Lonnie put a lot of wisdom. Yeah, yeah, people it's don't. Who I talk to till this day. Oh, people yeah, yeah. He... I, I Facebook periodically with him, but I was so I was so green and new in the world that he was just a, a, a cat who was just up there, like almost like a Dion Cole is right now to some of these young That's kids. right. But That's we right. were always, you know, but he was he would come in and out of the room. He had moved to L.A. Uh, or New York, wherever he moved. As Listen, soon as I started working at all, when <laughs> when he, this let me tell you when he moved to L.A. Yeah, I remember he said I'm going to L.A. Mm-hmm. And then I did a show again. It was a group of us that worked together. It was me, Lonnie, Cheryl Underwood, yeah, and Andre. Okay, and we were killing places. We did the Phoenix Club in Hyatt Park. Yeah, yeah. You remember the Phoenix Club? I think the sign still might be hanging out there. There's been many things since then. Yeah, and then Sawyer's. We did a show at Sawyer's. I know Sawyer's very. And well. it ended. Well, after 10, 11 o'clock, again, I'm a kid out in these Chicago streets. I know nothing about Chicago. Yeah. Cheryl Underwood and Andre says, we're going to L.A. tonight. Mm. In this little hatchback car they had. I yeah. said, tonight, they said, right now, you can get in the car and come with us. I, I just did the New York thing. I was starving. Yeah. And they, so you didn't go. They, they, yeah. They didn't go. I who who you, did I see him coming to America? Andre. Yeah. He coming to America. And then who did I see on Make Me Laugh? Cheryl Underwood. Yeah. Soon after that. Actually, you know, as a person who got the chance to watch all of these acts, especially people from other cities, Cheryl Underwood had one of the most precisely intelligent setup sets, period. It she's funny crazy. and she's smart. Yeah, she she you could tell that she has a I think she said she had a master's. You could tell yeah. that she wrote her educated. she wrote her hour as if it was a dissertation. Now it was a dissertation on fucking and getting dick. But uh, that was her. That's how she was before then. It's the powers that be liked her. Godfrey. Yeah. Hey, Godfrey used to beg me, how do I do this? Yeah. Yeah. He went to school with my brother at U of I. Yeah. And he was always like, How do I do this? Yeah, I was at U of I with your brother at the same time too. And Godfrey. You know, he got picked. Uh, Dion Cole, who went to school with me, who's younger than me, used to yeah. who stole my car actually. 
Uh, what? Deion was a car thief? Deion Cole <laughs> stole my car. It was a Renault, a Renault Alliance. He got in and realized it was a stick shift and couldn't go nowhere. I actually called him and David Royster uh -huh. stole my car. They were like truly stealing it or they were trying to just use it because they knew you? Were they going to return your car? They were going to return the car. Okay. <clears throat> So it was it was y'all were friends and they were like trying to take advantage of. I was dating Denise Royster and, and and David was her brother and and Dion lived across the street and also went to school with me but getting younger, yeah. and when I was uh, probably smooching with Denise, they got yeah. my keys. Yeah. David got my keys and. Okay. Got my, go I, heard, I, heard, I heard the stick shift grinding, <laughs> and I was like, "What the fuck are y'all doing?" Yeah. And Dion, he he couldn't they couldn't move the car because it was a stick shift. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's you know, hilarious. That, that now was this funny. was was this Denise that worked at All Jokes Aside? No, or, that no, no. That I don't funny. know who this two Denise entirely is. different Denises. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who this Denise is. So, so uh, I, I'm not sure because remember, I'm I'm I came in the game. I had graduated college. Well, no, I was in my sophomore and junior year of college when I would do it in the summer. And when I graduated, I came back to do it full time at night. So. Um, so somebody, a lot of these people I just know about, like Pat McGill, that name, I vaguely remember her in and out. You know who I'm talking about? No. Somebody named Pat something. She was the old school uh, comic. Uh, I thought her last her name, name. is Ringer Bell. That doesn't Chuck Gano, sense. that's the name I was trying to think of earlier. Chuck okay. Gano. Barbara Gano and Chuck Gano really okay. helped to shape me. Okay. And that's cool, man. That's, I mean, again, you uh, were one of the cats who lived in Chicago. In the at, Phoenix, Illinois, outside of Chicago. Yeah, you know, I mean, in the Chicago area for the, for the most part, who, whose name could go on the, um, on the bill and could pack out the weekend that um, wasn't, uh, no disrespect to you, that wasn't nationally famous or yes. was, was in Chicago. Like a lot of them cats weren't, there yet but you were there you know what i mean like almost like um i mean i don't think that there was anybody that really could compare to your talent level and your draw and i think raymond saw that and that's why um you know you were able to get so many bookings in that system mm -hmm. versus you know even a corey they 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 book corey a lot in the later years but then you know, Corey yeah, Corey you know, I was the first comedian to open All Jokes Aside. Well, that's what I'm saying, man. And I was the last comedian to perform when it closed. Closed, really? Because this is what happened. Yeah. They said we need a clean comedian, and the only name they can come up with. Ron Baker. Some Andre said, "I know a guy named yeah. Ron Baker Jr." They had no idea who I was. Right. And so. Uh, you came I guess in that and was murdered. Murder. I came in. <laughs> I have that clip. I, I'm gonna put it back up. Yeah. On my on my uh, Facebook page, and it it worked. You know, Raymond liked me, and then I had a relationship with the big churches or mega churches, Reverend Meeks. So Reverend Meeks, one of the things that happened is Reverend Meeks Church. He got up and made an announcement, and they bought out all of the shows That's what I'm saying. for the weekend. And and then so, uh, what had happened to me is. Denise came to me and said, I'm, I'm sorry, Mary. Mary. Mary said, can you, he, she didn't ask me, she had all the other comedians because it was one of the queens of comedy. What's her name that takes her wig off? The more? No, no, the queens of comedy. It was only four queens of comedy. Yeah. It was Monique, uh -huh. Adele. Who else was the other? I thought Samor. Samor was Samor, Samor wasn't in the original Queens of Comedy. It was uh, the older lady. She's a much older lady. I don't know her name was Casey. Yeah. She from she, Chicago? No, no. She was she was she on uh, with Tom uh, Joyner. She's no no. Yeah. She was a headliner. Damon uh, only filled in one of the nights because uh, George Wilborn was the normally the host. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And That's they asked cool. everybody to not curse as much and alter their acts. <laughs> because the Reverend could. Meeks Church had bought out every single show. Yeah. And they told uh, Mary, when he's finished, because I was just a feature, we're going to get oh. up and leave. 
Oh wow, really? Her place would have been empty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, did she shift you to headliner then, or, or she didn't shift me to headliner? What I said is to the other comedians, I would not want anybody to change their act just because of how I do my act, right? And just because of who's attending. Yeah. So, and I wish this lady's name would come back to my my mind, but it's just not coming back to my mind. So is she, she still alive now? Yes, she is. Yes, she is. Um, she, again, it was only four queens of comedy. And she was one of the queens. Okay. And Go ahead. Was she, so she was dirtier than she had ever been any of the other shows after, you know, when Mary had told her this. Of course she was. So the next yeah. night we had another show. And this is when we were doing, I think, a show on Thursday, two on Friday, three on, sun, uh, three on Saturday, and two on Sunday. Oh, I know who you're talking about, but I, uh, her name is not up here on the thing. Keep going. Original. What's her name? Uh, Laura Hayes. Yes. Laura Hayes. Ms. Yeah, Miss Laura. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Miss Laura. So, Miss Laura goes, she says, I was so convicted when I got finished. She says at night, she said, because when I looked to the left side, it was the deacons. And when I looked to the right side, it was the church mothers. And she said, I got so convicted, I couldn't sleep at night, you know. Mm, yeah. Did you she know, people, bomb? Did no, she didn't bomb. She just felt like not, she was extra nasty. She was, you know, when you ask a comic not to do something, they're going to yeah. do it and they do it even harder. That's just a lot of them, yeah. Especially a headliner, you know. Yeah. Never asked anybody to alter their act yeah. in a club because of somebody else or what's going out there. Do what you do. <clears> I tell people yeah. that all the time. Sometimes people work with me and feel like they have to adjust to how I do what I do. Yeah. Because I do what I do, and you don't, you don't, you don't have to do church stuff because you work with me. I actually cuss. Yeah, I, I actually know. do a lot of stuff that is non-church related, yeah. and I didn't start out doing comedy that way. Right, it just landed that way. Yeah, yeah, we had that conversation before, man. Yeah, I worked I, for you when you hired me, and yeah, yeah, it was dope, man. I, I, I was surprised that you said yeah. That's how I looked at it. like Ron said yeah. <laughs> I was surprised I said yeah. It was down the street for me, you know. Yeah, so I was I remember. like. <laughs> you know, they give me and a free I meal, they pay me, it's gonna be I don't have to really spend no gas. Yeah, yeah. But that you, dude you're one of the few up, cats <laughs> that allow me to be free. Hey man, shit. And don't judge me, allow me to be me. There's some yeah. comments that heard me cuss and they were like, You're phony. And I'm like, No, you just haven't heard me cuss. They not doing nothing anyway. If anybody I mean, but if it's not Damon, because I would I don't think Damon would say that to you, but well, the, you know what? Damon, I'm gonna man, tell you I something. Damon, Damon was was he said I'm confused by you? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, George Wilborn was upset that I cursed. He said, "Nigga, you said dick and pussy." I said, "I said I'm gonna be, a, I'm gonna be a little blue." He said, "Little blue, nigga, you said dick and pussy." This was I'm gonna tell you what club this was at. This yeah. was the um, Isaac Hayes Club. Oh yeah, I, man, I, I had a chance to do that through B Code. That was awesome. It was man. a great club. Yeah. But him and the promoter was so upset, I had to go do another show for them for free. He wasn't going to pay me. What? And that's what I learned is, nah, whatever the push. promoter is hiring you to do, yeah, you he, do he what pushed. the promoter is hiring you to do. Whether yeah. the crowd is, he, he didn't care about that. He said, we promoted you as a clean comedian. And you said dick and pussy. I think it was a joke about Adam. I, I think it was, uh, I wanted to talk about sucking dick is not new. Right. You know, I said, you, I said, you think Eve got Adam to bite the apple just don't bite, but she sucked his dick first, then he bit the apple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I said, you think Samson just said, you know, I'm going to tell her where my strength lies. She sucked his dick three times before he said, okay, I'm going to tell you, it's in my head, bitch. <laughs> right. Whatever you want to know, Whatever just do you, it you again. Know. I said, please. You know, yeah. sucking dick is is not nothing new, and it's not bad, especially if you're married. I was like Abraham. I said Sarah sucked Abraham's dick. You know, listen, you right. couldn't have baby would suck this dick then. You know, right, 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 right. right. Yeah, yeah. So it, they they thought it was too off color and. Uh, well, you had, you had to expect when when uh, ever you hit the stage for most people, uh, you, they had expectations for you, and you they still do. And they so, uh, unfortunately, it's almost like Jimmy Walker. You called in that. Just because you were so good at what you're doing. Yeah. You were so good at yeah, what you yeah. did. And there was such an anomaly that when you changed up for whatever reason you wanted to, other people may not may not have easily absorbed it. And you know how Chicago is. It's, some of it might have been. Chicago is a funny acting city. Yeah, it's very funny acting. Very so. funny. And that's in anything. 
Yeah. Whether it be gospel, R and B, they like who they like, they want uh -huh. what they want. I like steppers. Don't do steppers only, only want to do one thing. Right. Step. Yeah. Exactly. House music people only want one thing. Yeah. House music. Yeah. You know, rappers, hip hoppers, they only want one thing. Right. Hip hop. So yeah. if you try to alter something, <laughs> but uh I like to be creative. I mean, I'm yeah. more than just a one dimensional guy. There's many dimensions mm -hmm. to me that I like to be able to display. Now that I'm acting, I have yeah. A few TV shows that I've spoken on now mm -hmm. uh, that I get residuals from. I have a, a USAA commercial that's airing. Nice. And some other things that are coming out now where now I get to expand. Act, expand. Thank you, Gil Talent, for believing yeah. in me. I've mm -hmm. never been with an agency other than Gil Talent, and I've never had an agent, and I've never had a manager. Yeah, yeah. And, and Everything I've gotten, flirt. I've gotten on my own. Yeah, that's a, that's an unfortunate thing in Chicago, man, because I've seen people move to L.A. very lightly talented and all of a sudden they get management and all of that. When if they were if L.A. was a little bit brighter or if the people that work in Chicago as Guild Town and other people were a little bit more. Um, I don't know what the right word would be uh, aggressive about uh, cultivating talent. They have the higher talent, I think, in cities like Detroit and Chicago. Mm -hmm. Versus now, Horace H.P. Sanders, my good friend, man. who's also my reader, brilliant yeah. guy. Yeah, uh, absolutely. He, he, he did well on Star Search, and he's the mm -hmm. only person that ever got uh, five stars with the judges and five stars with America. They would talk about him on all the late shows. Right, yeah. I, I will say this, oftentimes we may mismanage our own careers. Yeah. Well, we don't know we, we don't know the intricacies of doing it. It's really, we shouldn't have to be managing on the level that we are on uh, doing. We shouldn't have to. Once you get to a certain level, of talent, somebody should be able to be smart enough to say, hey man, that Ron Baker Jr., you do, to be honest with you, the business side of me would say, I would market to the churches across the nation and, I've and tried charge that. my ass off if I had your talent or if I had you as a client. Now I don't take on, I don't take on clients just because uh whatever my foolish end might be because i could have made quite a bit of money knowing marketing the way i do mm -hmm. knowing how to set up the systems the way i do knowing the comedians and the uh, uh people in the in the uh environment but i just i just never grabbed it man it wasn't i, my know, I think my name was on a list or something uh of what <laughs> to, black to, ball to, people yeah don't don't get in you know i i have some nah. personal thoughts and theories really but, uh, what yeah, could it have been? Know. What could you have done wrong? I've never heard anybody talk ill of you. And I think I heard Damon and George mention the fact that they were surprised about you cursing. I might have even been in the room. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> George and I, who are really good friends. Yeah, that's my uh, most George suggested if I wanted to do that to change my name from Ron Baker Jr. to something, go by a different name and go to some remote cities and, and, and develop my act then sure don't but, know what he's talking about uh but, but, but george has had you know a, a good level of success yeah but but he you he, know uh, george but can he don't know you. and still work in radio and i got fired in radio for playing everybody was kung fu fighting when the store uh, uh uh regarding the story of juanita Bynum when her and her husband was fighting in the parking lot well, listen, man, George is, one, George is the reason why I continue to start doing comedy. I fell in love with what he was doing, and he is, uh, I consider him a, a, a not only one of the influences like yourself, but the main mentor and influence that caught me in. So I'm not saying he's not valuable, but what I am saying is, is he doesn't know what God has sent for you or what your path is so he can tell you some stuff what to do but i think you have built up such a great brand that that might have been what he was referring to but hey man it's a cat that we know that came from chicago named pete holmes pete holmes had uh is a white boy that used to do comedy in the same rooms that we that i started in mm -hmm. bomb fest he was <laughs> but he, he would never curse and he would write his jokes. They would bomb horribly. We actually would call him at times a bathroom break because everybody would go out to the bathroom during his time. That motherfucker right now is one of the most uh, popular white comics to come out of Chicago. He had his own Tonight Show. It didn't last that long, 
Mm -hmm. but he had it. You know what I mean? He was writing for people. Um, so his brand got built the way it is. And the reason why I bring it up is because he started off saying he wasn't going to cuss. Now on all his shows, he cussed. Right. So you know, out of all the people I know that are successful, yeah, they they cuss. You know, yeah. when I think I can only think of two names of comedians that don't cuss, and that and was Sinbad and Bill Cosby. And Bill Cosby and Sinbad. Now uh, I hope he's getting better. He had a stroke. Yep. And uh, Bill Cosby. Uh, he had a stroke he from ha holding back all them cuss work. Uh, he didn't cuss. I, I, I didn't know him to cuss. You know, I've talked with him several times, but yeah. those are only two. That's that's a small number. Yeah. No, no. So anybody it's, that's uh, getting picked from Chicago curses. Yeah, you well, the, you, your audience feeds, it's really about mar um, the market bears what the audience wants. And when you go in and you're not, see the te see what, in the beginning I told you, you were able to deal with the, with the drug dealers and all of the stuff that would come in and out of all jokes aside because your show was honed so well. Even the person that ain't been to church since they was four, was mm -hmm. riding with you and it was funny it was incredible all of that so it was a it was a high level talent that very few actually make a lot of money on the stage you, you know who knows what you you know where you end up i'm not saying i'm i'm looking forward to you continuing doing what you do you do what you do but sinbad made it off of being like the same way you were same cloth Super funny that no matter who in the audience. Sinbad is one of the top that. comedians of all time without question. Yeah, exactly. We running out of time. So, okay, so we get into the end of this first question. So, okay, so these last couple of minutes, I'm not going to hold you too much longer, bro. You and thank you for interviewing me, Aaron. I appreciate on, it. I, um, I was, I was uh, like, man, I wonder if he's going to do it. <laughs> I, I, actually, I said I wasn't going to do it, and I really don't give interviews. Oh really? Well, thank you yeah, for uh, yeah. I really don't give it, um, but you you've always been cool, and uh, again, I've always allowed me to be myself yeah, and never judgmental, it. never fake. You know, you had me on the Man Cow Show. Yeah, you know, I was one of the names you called to say, "Come on here," which uh, that was an interesting situation. But it you, always you, is. <laughs> yeah, but at least you, you you let me in, and and I and I can't tell you many cats that I know know uh -huh. will not uh, invite you in. Uh, they cowards, man. They they don't understand that the that they feel like the talent walking in the room is gonna jeopardize their situation. I, I don't have that thought. Plus, hell, I'm like Puffy, man. I'm gonna surround myself with talent, so I look yeah. talent. Yeah, that's not the <laughs> Chicago mentality. No, you know, I like I, Dame Dash said. He says, "I don't want to be the only millionaire. I want many more millionaires around me Wu -Tang, that I've helped baby. To create become millionaires. I want more millionaires around me." Okay, but, so uh, speaking of that, speaking of that, before we run out of time. We walked into a portion where you were talking about people who you influence. Give us a list of people, people who, who are, what? that you influence. Like you talked okay. about Lil Rail opening up for you. Not that they have to reach back, although I think a lot of them should, and some of them do in certain small ways. Corey Holcomb, um, go ahead and read out some of the other people who's who's opened well, Craig, up. Craig Robinson house. used to come over my house and, yeah. and practice and rehearse, and he brought his keyboard, and he was like, yeah. you know, I'm thinking about doing this with the keyboard. Does it work? Is it funny? Yeah. You know, we was we were tight. We're still cool today. Yeah. And uh, Dion Cole, who literally took in all the information I gave him, yeah. and did it. Because yeah. I told him that um, mm -hmm. black trying to do comedy in the Black Comedy Club can be an illusion for where you're really trying to go. Yeah. I said you had to get into those white comedy clubs. Yeah. So uh, I would say, you know, Godfrey and uh, Dion really listen. You know, yeah. uh, one of the first person that called me, who's a new cat on the scene, he's not too new now, is I got a call saying, "Can you talk to my cousin? He just won on Channel Nine, the funniest comedian in Chicago." It was Kelvin uh, Evans. Calvin Evans, yeah, Calvin, Calvin Evans. Evans. He bubbling real, real well right now. Great, yeah. talented dude. Fraternity Again, he, he listened to what I said, and then sometimes when I would see him, he would watch me. Yeah, and I can see that he was really taking. In He's a student. He's yes, definitely how I was doing what I was doing, yeah. but everything I told him, I see him on that on that white side. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Have you been to his show on uh, Saturday nights? Have I you tried not. to get in there? I have not been. Send him an email, man. Send him an email. But he's one of my favorites. Though. I, I've hired. Yeah. Anytime I've had a chance to hire him, yeah. I have hired him. Yeah. Because he is really, really good. <clears throat> yeah. Um, 
I've seen him when he's been on NBC. Uh-huh. You know, I'd like to kind of see him lose some of the B-boy image and okay. uh, put on a suit or put on a jacket, the hat backwards and all that. I think that's for the girls, man. I think that's for the women. Yeah. He, he, he may not be trying to get the church women. Pussy will only take you so far in this business. You need money. <laughs> well, you know what? Good point. Don't hear what I'm talking about because I don't know how to be. <laughs> I don't know how to blow up. <laughs> I have my point. I just like I'm to see him be a little bit more because he's got great yeah. content. Oh yeah, he's he's definitely on his way, man. Because he started playing the piano and stuff on stage. Well, I seen see that? that. It looked it looked very much like what Craig you, Robinson yeah, does. Yeah, y'all used to do. Yo, uh, actually, I, I create a magazine, man, called CStandUp.com. I'm starting to get it to flourish a little bit more. I'd like to have you on the cover, man. Um, I'm going to use some of this interview to create the article. And I'd wow. like to first the humor mill, now this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, you never know where this stuff can go, right? But I'm not doing it for that. I'm doing it for the love of the game. Um, but I need you, you but I'm going to need you to send me some some uh, pictures unless I have to come out and take some up either way. You know, so it was, you know, that's what. I don't know how that sounded when you just said, unless I'm going to have to come out and take some of you. <laughs> it just sounded. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, you know, like a photographer. And stuff. I know, I know. It just sounded like yeah, yeah. on his casting couch. Uh, you know. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Did he put well, his hands on you like this? Yeah, yeah. Nah, this ain't. This Did ain't he shake up. you like this? No, I'm <laughs> hey, I'm gonna tell you something though. Yeah. I think some of why I'm not where I'm at is because I I don't uh, do you some of that. You don't blow, dude, for your position. You know. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm That's interesting. Like, like, Have you had a situation where I've you had, had, yes, I've had I had a few. You want to uh, talk about it? In, uh, no, I'm I'm still in therapy. Goddamn. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you in therapy? You, you know, have to no, decide just, if you should have did it or not. You know, when niggas are like, whose dick do I have to suck to get this part or be in yeah, this thing? Yeah. You know. Yeah, they always accuse D. Ray of that man. All them ca hater cats who's hating on him be like, man, D. Ray. He probably went in there and sucked a dick to get where he at. I, I, I wouldn't say that about him, but the motherfucker. I'm not going to say that about trailer. anybody, but I will yeah. say this. There are certain situations that do arise that uh, you got a choice to make. Is that right? You know, and I have been told by some very high people, <clears throat> you can't get over there unless you do that. Okay, well, I've that had some phone calls I into my, into my uh, hotel room uh, about certain people and let me know how this game was played. I've had early conversations in my career about some big name people and male and female. So there's a lot of things. Uh, Chicago is, is a political city mm -hmm. and Hollywood is a sexy city. Um, incestuous or some other word because sexy is just too common. Yeah, it's sexy, but but I was looking have, for the sexy was the only word I could come up with. I couldn't come up yeah, with a clever word. Yeah, to go with where I was going. That whole Weinstein thing is right because it's you know you know you know it, it's you, it's some things you have to do, and if you do that, now you're over there. And okay. Corey Holcomb talks about that on his on his fifty. Yeah, yeah, show. he do. They, and um, I was I was actually kind of shocked, like, oh, he's saying it out loud. Yeah, that's. That's one of the main things why Hollywood won't grab on to him the correct way because the dude's talent level is unseen. It's right, just, yeah. it's uh, for his niche, for what he do, yeah. can't nobody mm -hmm. compare mm -hmm. to him. And he has a whole, I mean, he's making the money on his own now. He has his own machine, which I think other people right. should pay attention to. Right. Briefly, Everybody can't do what he's doing though, but he's a good hustler. No, he's, he's, an, funny. he's an incredible hustler and businessman. Not the nicest guy in the world. You know what I mean? He that's got, just him. That's just how he is. I know. I, no, I was there the day he, he said he was leaving to go to L.A. I was mm -hmm. next, sitting next to him up there at uh, Riddles. It was like right. the last couple of, not Riddles, uh, uh, T.J. Hook or uh, uh, Comedy Hook, TNT Comedy Hook, but back in the day. We were sitting up there, I think it was there, and he was like, man, I'm going to Hollywood. But he didn't have no money. He was right. trying he, to he had a suspended out. license and he was suspended. driving a hoop. Yeah, exactly. But he made it, man. And, but, and, but made, that's why I say everybody's going to face an abyss. Somebody's going to face an impossible looking situation. Yeah. You still have to remain steadfast and immovable to what um, you believe you should be doing mm -hmm. and go out there and you do you. Uh, right. My life has been much different than I thought it would have been. I literally, Aaron, have watching people live my dream out exactly the way I've dreamed it, scene for scene. 
yeah. and I say, God, why has thou forsaken me? But he hasn't forsaken me. I have a beautiful family. Mm -hmm. um, my kids are doing very well. I've been able to be there in them lives, especially when they needed me yeah. the most. Um, I've been able to be there when my ex-wife has called and said, listen, this is happening. I've been there. Had I been at another level, I may not have been able to be there in that capacity. Sometimes money will answer all things, but yeah. me physically being present, my daughter could never say, my daddy was not there. Yeah, yeah. And that's way more valuable than the money. When yeah, my son can never it. say, my daddy was not. Right. When I needed him, I, I was there. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's valuable, and, and, and I'm glad for that. But listen, I'm not, I'm not dead yet. I still have <laughs> Nobody a lot of energy. You, right. know, uh, I've, I, you know, however God is going to use me, yeah. I feel like I'm ready uh, to be using that capacity. I still got jokes. I'm still funny. Oh, Some people still hire me. Yeah, I'm still trying to get in these clubs. You know, I'm still, you know, I'll do club church. You shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't have no there. problem getting into the improv, man. You just gotta uh, go up there. My my word is not good up there. They're they're angry at me over some BS. Rob actually was the one who put it back. Are you the James the Hanna of Chicago now? <laughs> I think for a minute I got jaded like that too. You know what I mean? Like um, after the Laugh Factory stole the nasty show from me, um, and I had that fallout. Then I went over to the improv, opened up their stuff, and they blatantly stole it from me. They just, you know, was like, fuck you, we're going this direction. I get it, because Tony Schofield was on the radio, George was on the radio, but, you know, for them to be, uh, for them to have a certain 